Um, okay, so then let me thank the inviter. Oh, sorry. Let me thank the organizers for inviting me to be here. And uh, I'm very uh, happy that reinforcement learning theory is guiding interest to more and more people in developing computer science. And also, I don't know if you are aware of this, so there will be a full semester program on reinforcement learning theory in the next fall here at Science Institute. So hopefully we can together make a lot of progress in theoretical RL. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about, again, reinforcement learning and its basic theory. And I'll focus on RL in feature space and the complexity of the drug analysis. So uh, Nan already made a very nice introduction, so he has laid uh, the basic uh, Work, so I don't have to repeat uh, the background again. So basically, we, we all know that so RL has been very successful empirically with computer games, AlphaGo, I and mean, simple Atari games like Majuko, like humanoid robots, and uh, maybe with certain scenarios with self-driving cars. Okay, so basically, we know that RL is getting more and more powerful in real life. But however, if we look at all these applications, so we realize that in computer games or in certain uh, simulated robotic applications or in certain e-commercial applications, so basically the accessibility to data is unlimited. In games, basically, usually we don't talk about data in games, but when we do like self-play in AlphaGo, really this, our, our algorithm the learning algorithm is generating data and trajectories. So essentially, one can generate infinite amount of data in these applications. And then solving the problem becomes computation. OK. But however, let's consider other scenarios where we cannot do RL efficiently yet. yet. For example, if we want to use optimization RL to figure out the best clinical treatment, apparently, I wouldn't myself trust an RL algorithm at its current stage. Because for every particular scenario, every particular condition, and particular group of patients, the amount of data available might be quite limited. And all the practical decisions in real life are made based on domain expertise. And similarly, if we understand how single cell evolves, so this needs to, one, has, one can only understand it by collecting actual data in the wet lab, and the collection of Data is very costly. And similarly, if we talk about reinforcement learning for clinical trials, then each data point could be a human life. So they are definitely very expensive. But this is completely different from um, the game settings. OK, so what are basic theoretical questions in RL? So first, if we just think about studio machine learning, the first ever question we care about is, well, I want to I have to learn a classifier, or I want to learn a predictor. And I have some information about it. So how many data points do I need? So similarly, in reinforcement learning, a very basic question is, suppose that I want to get a good policy, maybe a 90% efficient policy, or maybe just 50%. Maybe 50% efficient is good enough to beat the human champions. OK, suppose that that's what I want. How many samples are needed? And how do we use the samples to uh, if in an efficient way. And a related and potentially harder problem is, suppose that we want to learn to control a process on the fly. Then how much regret do we have to pay? And they are strongly related problems. OK. So just to recap on the model of reinforcement learning. So let's look at the very basic tabular case for Markov decision process. So I'll just uh, introduce my own notations. So I call the set of possible states, S, S for state space. And the sets for possible actions, we call it A. And at every state, upon assigning an action, there is a reward function, which could also be random. And uh, also, the system is going to evolve according to some transition probability law. And in reinforcement learning, we do not know the transition probability law for the system to evolve under state and actions. And the optimization formulation is that we want to find a policy. By policy, we mean that we want to find a mapping from the, state, the space of states to the space of actions in order to maximize the cumulative return of 
the Markov decision process when this policy pi is implemented. Okay, so uh, sometimes we call this basic problem, we call it tabular MDP. By tabular, we mean that basically we have a bunch of states, but we have no other knowledge about the connection among the state space. So we don't have any structure knowledge. This is a tabular case. Okay. Um, so let's talk about sample complexity first. So what does A sample mean? So this is uh, Tetris. So by one sample, we mean that, suppose that we have one state of the game Tetris, and then maybe we choose an action or the algorithm choose an action. And the game is going to evolve with some randomness. And also it's going to be generating a reward at this transition. And then we look at this triplet state action reward and state triplet. Okay, we call this triplet to be one sample for RL. Okay. Uh, so the question is, how many of those triplets do we need at least in order to get an absolute <coughs> optimal policy? Okay, so those are the uh, sharpest results that I am aware of. Okay, so first, the information directly limit was... We do have the reward in that triplet as well, right? Uh, okay, for this, I'm considering the simplified case when the reward is a known function. But in, uh, more generally speaking, the complexity of estimating reward is much less than the complexity for estimating model. So it doesn't matter if we know the rewards or not. That makes sense? Okay. So the information directly limits is this, which was established by a group of uh, folks at DeepMind. So basically, we know the information limit. To get an absolute optimal policy with a reasonable probability, this is the number of samples that we need. Each sample is a triplet. Okay. So this is number of states multiplied with number of actions. So that's basically the total possibility, the total number of possibilities. Okay. And this cube is actually pretty important. The cube is, um, this cube is pretty magical here and a lot of efforts have been put into trying to reduce the sample complexity of algorithms to reach that cubic. Okay, so um, the sharpest algorithm we are aware of can actually achieve the sample complexity lower bound. So we had a result uh, from last year, and also recently I believe uh, Alec showed that it's also possible to achieve this result under certain conditions using a similar method. Okay. So in short, it is already known that how to achieve the sample complexity lower bound in reinforcement learning in the tabular case without any structural information. And uh, to get to this, we need to do a lot of things like variance reduction, like uh, understanding error accumulation and uh, across iterations, and uh, also how to understand the total variance accumulation of a Markov process. But by putting everything together, it's possible to achieve the lower bound. And also, uh, in terms of regret, there have been a lot of work on regret for RL. For example, uh, I believe she showed that for H horizon MDP, so by doing something, uh, by doing a variant of Q learning, one can achieve this regret. Although this is not optimal, right? We believe maybe the optimal should be just linear in H, but this is something no one has been able to do. So it's uh, quite open, it's quite open. Okay. So basically, uh, at least in terms of discount factors, the size, the sizes of state and action spaces, we already know the sharpest serial complexity. And also for regret, we are pretty good. Why, why should it be linear in H? Because the other ones are gamma cubed. So isn't that H cubed? Oh, so this is because this absolute error is for a value on the order of one over one minus gamma. But this is regret, so one, so one order of magnitude is absorbed into the regret itself. Okay. So okay. H squared would be how the, 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 the okay. setting in our paper is slightly different. Yeah, so the setting is slightly different. It depends on whether it's no, transition is stationary. And uh, if it's stationary, it's H. And if it's not stationary, it's H squared. And also depending right. on how you count, like whether T is number of episodes versus number of steps. Yeah, I think this is number of steps, right? Right. Okay. Okay, so basically there's a problem. 
So we all know, we sort of know the, the sharp and close to sharp sum of complexity regrets, but we don't like those results because S, the state space, is too big. So let's just look at this. So suppose that the state we are working with, say that they are d-dimensional vectors. So maybe in a simple problem like mounting car, so it, it, uh, I think it's three or four dimensional like velocity and positions and maybe acceleration. So it's a multi-dimensional vector to characterize the physical state of the process. Right. If our input are raw pixel images, then the dimension is going to be the, the number of pixels in the images. OK, so say that we don't have any structural knowledge. So we just do vanilla tabular MDP. And then we just do vanilla discretization. Then the state space is basically going to be 2 to the d. We can also look like the size of the policy space. The size of the policy space is going to be number of actions to the s because we have freedom to choose any action at any state. And even if we take log of the policy space, we still get dependence on s and exponential in dimension of the state vectors. OK, so apparently this is pretty pessimistic. OK, so now let's look at where does dimensionality show up in the Bellman equation. So Bellman equation is like the KKT condition. It's the optimatic condition for optimal control and the Markov decision problems. So this is the average reward Bellman equation. I choose the average reward here because it's cleaner. Okay. So basically solving the Markov decision process is equivalent to finding the solution to this high dimensional nonlinear system. And basically, for every single state S, we need to make a decision A to maximize our immediate return and uh, uh, future cumulative returns. And then this maximization over A applies to every single state. Right. Every single state. Here. So we have a high dimensional nonlinear equation. So another way to look at this is Bellman equation actually has an equivalent minimax formulation. So one can try, to, so this, is, this will be an interesting exercise. Start here, first show that this equiv is equivalent to a linear program. And the linear program has a primal dual formulation. And the primal dual formulation is nicer to work with, in which the primal variable is over the space of value functions. And the dual variable is over the space of, I would say, long run frequency distributions, or in this average work case, just stationary state action distributions. So we have duality between value functions and long run distributions. Okay. So if we look at this, this, uh, this should be something that will, that's more familiar to us. Right? Now it's like an empirical risk minimization problem. Okay. So we have strong duality and smoothness and the linearity here. So fundamentally, Bellman equation is about a high dimensional linear program, which is S times A times S. So in the case when we have continuous state problems, this is essentially an infinite dimensional LP. Okay. So now let's think about dimension reduction. So in practice, people use feature maps. So feature maps is a popular approach for dimension reduction of RL, uh, I mean, way before deep learning was used in RL. So for example, I believe in 1990s, people can already solve Tetris pretty well using 22 features. But Tetris is a very simple game. Okay. So by features, we mean like, suppose that this is the state of Tetris. Then we look at this and try to come up with features. Maybe the top one features is going to be height of the, the wall. And the top two feature may be like the number of holes on the top level. So there are a bunch of hand-picked features. Okay. So suppose that we have 22 hand-picked features. Then what people do is, uh, they can try to map every single state into a 22-dimensional feature vector. And hopefully that helps. Okay. So the basic idea <coughs> here is now in order to estimate the high-dimensional value functions to make it work in a computer program, one can use a linear model to represent the high-dimensional value function for a particular policy. So everything can be computed in the linear, in a simpler linear space. So suppose that we try to compute the value of this state, then we know the weights w1, w2, w3. And then we simply calculate the weighted combination. 
And this is a proxy to the value function and can be used in tree search or like Monte Carlo methods. So this has been used for a long time in reinforcement learning or in approximate dynamic programming before the use of deep learning. Okay. And apparently, a linear model has a lot of limitations, as Nan already mentioned. So, OK. But however, I want to argue that uh, linear models are the most basic models for understanding the theory and the mathematics of reinforcement learning. So that's the focus of my talk. So one way to think about the dimensional reduction of Bellman equation is the following. We have already seen that Bellman equation is high dimensional and nonlinear. But to make it more compatible to ERM, we can think about this as a minimax problem. So now we have a Lagrangian function, which is linear in primal value function and do distributions. OK. And also, we have unknown transition probability model here, which can be replaced by empirical samples. OK. And we are working with a problem with high dimensional primal space and high dimensional do space. And now, if we have modeling assumptions, we can restrict our search space to our model classes. And a simple thing to do is to replace, is to restrict the search space into a linear subspace spanned by the features. And if we do that, we can reduce Bellman equation into something pretty small and moderate that can be handled. I'm slightly confused. How do you handle PA? Mm -hmm. PA is unknown, right? PA is unknown. So one can, yeah. So the observation, it's going to be very big. Right, we won't need that, right. So I'm, high, I'm, I'm, not, sh I'm not showing the algorithm, uh, but the basic idea is PA in the Lagrangian is not known. But each sample gives me a noisy version of the partial gradient. So we can do a stochastic primal dual gradient type method to solve it. So that's actually one of our earlier paper and with my co-author Li Hong. And we can show that, well, by doing this primal dual policy, gradient method using one sample at a time, we don't need to know the piece. But one can find an absolute optimal policy using this sample size. This is a uh, number of state features times number of action features. And we had another recent result on Q learning, but we made it sample, op sample optimal as well. So again, we get number of state features and number of action features and cubic. So getting cubic was the hardest thing. And this matches the information directly from minimax lower bound. So just just to make sure uh, I'm on the right page here, this is still in the generative model. Yes, right? yes, exactly. So you're not talking about exploration? Not, not okay. yet. OK. Yeah. So uh, at least in this very, I would say, very basic setting of generative models, we know how to figure out the absolute optimal policy using the minimal sample size. And so we can reduce basically big S to number of state action features. So that's the first message. OK, so generative models are not practical enough. So we want to be better than that. So what do you mean by generative model? So generative model means that I have a perfect simulator of the game or of the system. And we can basically use the generative model to avoid this issue of exploration so that we can basically draw sample transitions from any pre-specified state action pairs. So which is reasonable if we, have, we actually have a simulator of the system. And also to get sample optimal algorithms, the, act, the algorithms actually need to generate <coughs> basically the same number of sample, samples per each state or per each directions or representative states to make sure that we basically have the, uh, we have the, the estimated policy well controlled uh, along every direction. Okay. But however, this is not practical if we cannot uniformly, frequently visit the samples, uh, the state space. So now let's consider uh, another scenario which has a lot more complications. Now we want to learn on the fly. Meaning that, okay, we have an H horizon control problem or, or we have an H horizon game. So we know that the game is going to end in H time steps. But however, we cannot sample from any intermediate state of the game. We have to play from the very start use, using certain policy till the end of the game. And then we can play again. Okay. So we want to make sure that 
the learning algorithm has to actually act in the real world. And uh, it has to act well, act in real time while making observations. And it's, the algorithm could adapt its control policy during the learning period. And uh, what's, comp what's, comp what's more complicated is that in this acting in the real world setting, it's not guaranteed that we can visit all states frequently enough. The algorithm is not designed in that way. There is possible that there's a particular hidden state and we just never get a chance to visit it. Okay. And in this setting, we care about the regret for episodic RL. So the, the regret is defined uh, very naturally by looking at the difference between the optimal value function from the initial state as S0 and the actual rewards we collect in one episode. Okay. And then we take the sum of this per episode regret, so we sum across all the n episodes. Okay, so that's the regret. And uh, so some challenges here is that, well, if we play a control game, so if we do something wrong on the first time step, and maybe we will just end up in a bad absorbing state, and we never learn in the next h plus one, sorry, h minus one time step. And also, uh, in terms of online learning, then we have a lot of data dependency because for each episode, um, the transitions or the sample, the sample transition triplets are generated by the same system using the same policy. And also my policy comes from my previous experiences. So there's dependency everywhere. And uh, if we try to find a naive reduction to just multi and bandit, what will happen is Basically, a naive reduction means that every policy could be one arm. And then we have number of arms that is exponential. Um, sorry, I think and Yeah, we have number of arms that is uh, exponential in, uh, actually, I think, I mean exponential in H in horizon. <laughs> sorry for the typo. Okay. Okay, now, let, now let's try to consider RL in online learning with features. So suppose that we're given the feature maps. So I already explained what are feature maps. So each state can be, ma can be mapped into a vector. Okay. And uh, I need to map state actions jointly into a feature map. So if we have separate state feature and separate action feature, we can take their product. Okay. And uh, so now, whenever I have a state action state triplet, I'm going to map it into a feature vector for state action and another feature vector for state. So maybe originally my states and actions are raw pixel images, but after this mapping, they should be lower dimensional vectors. Okay, and uh, let's look at one possible model for reducing the dimensionality of RL. So let's try to work with the transition kernel or the transition probability matrix. So as we have seen in the Bellman equation, all the complication come from the fact that this is a complicated function with dimension s times a and s. Okay, what if it admits a simpler lower dimensional decomposition structure? Maybe it's low rank. Okay, so we make the assumption that the transition kernel can be decomposed using the state action feature and the state feature. And then there exists a matrix here which we do not know. Okay, so let's see, does this bias anything? So one may wonder, so how does this decomposition model on the transition kernel relates to using features for value function approximation? So one can show that uh, actually this decomposition is equivalent to using linear models for value function approximation if there is zero Bellman error. Okay. So uh, essentially, um, I'm trying to say that low dimensional assumption on value function has to come from low dimensional assumption on the transition model. Otherwise, why would there be nicer, simpler structure about value functions? Okay. Can I, can I just ask a real quick clarification on that, mm -hmm. uh, that last point? So um, here, you, you, are you simply saying that if I want to represent, for example, just the optimal value function, uh, with zero error mm -hmm. in 
in uh, with a linear approximator. This this is equivalent to having some n of this form. Um, no. Oh, so this right. equivalence is about approximating value function on the entire solution path of policy improvement with zero Bellman error. Oh, okay. So that's a stronger. That's that's a, yeah, it's stronger. A stronger. It's not only about optimal value All function. All of the intervening value functions right. that I'm constructing have to have exact representations. Right, right. And also, I'm, I'm not making assumption on reward function. If the reward function has even lower dimensional structure, it's possible that we can do even better. And uh, by the way, so uh, what you call Bellman error here is like, I, I think Rumi and Chava sometimes call that the inherent Bellman error, right? So this is basically the, the kind of like the closeness assumption that I was talking about. Right, right. right. So it's, the, it's the violation of that closeness assumption. It's not right. the, about the single function, but about the property of the function class. Exactly. So actually, if the Bellman error is not zero, there could be, we could be in a lot of troubles. But I'll get, that, get back to that later. OK, let's, let's uh, first live in the simpler world, assuming that the matrix decomposition model is perfect. And uh, OK, so now let's see what we can do. <coughs> so suppose that we are playing this game, and we are at the beginning of the n plus 1 episode. And suppose that we have already collected a lot of trajectories and samples so far. And for each triplet that we have collected, we are going to map them into a 5 vector and a percent vector. OK, and now I want to simply estimate this lower dimensional matrix that parameterize the transition kernel. So to do that, we can simply do regression. So this is just a version of matrix uh, regression with a ridge regularizer. OK. So OK, can we, can we just do regression on the sample transitions to estimate the transition kernel? And apparently, we care about regret, right? So. It's very easy to see that in, only, in any online learning scenario, if we simply do the empirical estimate and do it greedily, then we are, we are not going to do well in exploration. So we can borrow ideas from linear bandit. Can we use bandit ideas to help exploration? OK. So we can first try to construct a confidence ball around the transition core matrix that we estimated from previous trajectories. And uh, I'm, I, I'm omitting a lot of details here. This AN is really just a covariance matrix from past samples. OK. And so we can control the confidence ball in a way that one can show that with high probability, the ground truth transition core always belongs to the sequence of confidence balls. And now when we do Bellman updates, we are going to do a version of Bellman updates that is optimistic in consideration of uncertainty in the confidence curve. So at every time we try to, yeah, sorry, I believe I, I miss a max over A somewhere. Okay. So at every time we try to do Bellman updates, we are supposed to have the transition matrix here, but we replace it with. The, op the most optimistic estimated transition matrix from the confidence ball. So we're taking max over core matrix from the ball. OK. And um, hopefully, every time we are getting a Q value that is higher than the actual Q values. So you're not doing any, any introducing any constraints to make sure this is a, these correspond to transition probabilities in the no, regression of the slide? No, we're not doing that, just, just regression. So it's really about just about regression to estimate the transition matrix and also using um, analyzing the uncertainty in regression to do an optimistic version of Q function updates. OK. And finally, we have computed new set of Q functions. And the next time when we actually play this game, we are going to simply use our optimistic Q functions greedily. And because every time we do this max over confidence ball, we can make sure that we are already adding the bonus functions so that the Q functions we are have computed are going to encourage exploration. OK. So uh, under a bunch of conditions, which I'm hiding here, one can show that now we have a regret bound. So the regret for this algorithm uh, in terms of time steps, not episodes, 
is dimensional feature space, h quadratic and square root of t. Okay. So we believe that this happens to be the first regret bound for reinforcement learning that is polynomial in feature dimension and uh, also in horizon h. And it's definitely independent of s. So hopefully, it will lead to a more practical algorithm. And one might ask whether this is minimax optimal. So if um, I don't have a minimax lower bound specifically for this problem, but if we borrow our knowledges from tabular reinforcement learning and also from linear bandit, then we should roughly know that the linear dependence on D is optimal. The dependence on H is definitely not optimal. Probably it should be square root of H. And also, um, square root, this root T is optimal. So are you familiar with this? So uh, Yassine and, uh, and Gerge have this, uh, I think, this preprint that's been sitting on archive since 2014 or something, where they're basically assuming that the transitions and rewards are both linear, and they, they are basically, again, doing exactly uh, this uh, linear bandit type estimation, uh, maybe with optimistic linear programming instead of. Uh, oh, is that the one called something like continuous state MDP? Contextual? Yeah, this is. No, but that's a different setting, right? That's a, is that different? It, it's similar because there's also a linear regression component in it, but okay. I think it's it's not the same. Okay, I, I, yeah, I, I, I just I was curious about the differences because I don't remember. I, I think it's, 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 it's kind of like the difference is like there's a toy, coin toss whether you do it every time step versus you do it like one time for the entire episode. But yeah, okay. And also, there's another one using this uh, feature dimension D, but that one is exponential in H. But that's probably not the one you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. So one may, one may uh, again, argue that the decomposition structure is too strong. Essentially, we're assuming a parametric model for the transition matrix. Okay, so let's try to relax it, up, relax it a little bit. So what if I do have five features for state actions, but however, I'm going to relax Psi the right feature space to be just the identity map. Does that make sense? So assuming that I have feature functions phi that can characterize the left singular space of the transition kernel. And I don't make any assumption on the right singular space. So now this becomes a non parametric model. OK. OK, so in this case, actually, Mitch, the, the algorithm I showed you has a closed form update. So we don't really have to maximize over a ball of infinitely dimensional or high dimensional matrices. But we can actually write the bonus function in explicit closed form. And the algorithm still works. And however, in this case, because we are losing lower dimensional structure on the right hand side, and this space is going to be the space to be multiplied with the next, next time step value function. So somehow in the analysis, we lose a square root in the dependence on D. And I don't know whether this is optimal. So maybe we can do that. OK. So uh, next, so the, the, the method I just explained can be naturally extended to the kernel space. So now suppose that I'm giving a kernel function to describe the state action space. But I don't have ex explicit feature maps. So actually, reinforcement learning in kernel space has been previously explored in pretty different settings without much theoretical guarantees. But kernels do present a very flexible framework, and they can be used to interpret neural networks as well. So I th we thought that it would be nice to have a kernel representation. So now the assumption changes to that. We are going to assume that the left and the right space for the transition kernel can be, represent uh, can be embedded by given RKHS. And in this case, the algorithm actually has an equivalent kernelization, which you don't have to read. And we, one can show that now the regret depends on basically the kernel norm, the Hilbert space norm of the unknown transition probability matrix. And also, it depends on some effective dimension of the kernel space. OK. What's the effective dimension? Uh, some like log determined uh, matrix thing over worst case data distribution. So it's essentially D in the original case. But in this case, it's like messy. <coughs> OK. So now we have seen that in the very basic simulation case, 
one can achieve good sample complexity. And also in the case when we believe that the transition model has this decomposition, again, one can get good regret, hopefully depending linearly on dimensional features. But however, using features for reinformed learning, well, there are uh, for and against. So first, the, the reason that we do this research is we want to understand the theory of RL, and linear models are a very basic model to study. And um, it also, when we do the analysis, all the analysis has a very deep connection to just statistical regression. So I think this is a very important observation. And also, uh, to do it in, with regression and uh, upper confidence type of methods, well, it's relatively easy to implement. By easy to implement, I mean that there are not many parameters to tune. But however, uh, using linear models um, have a lot of like pathological, pathological problems. So for example, so the approach I just described heavily rely on the fact that we actually have good or even per perfect features. And when we don't have good perfect features, what could happen is policy equation might lead to os oscillating features, or oh, sorry, oscillating policies and the chattering effect. So this is a plot I, I, I borrow from Bersika's book. So if the feature space cannot fully characterize the Bellman updates, what could happen is there might be different regimes and policy equation will just <coughs> lead to oscillating policies because the features are not good enough. We are not approximating the value functions in the correct space. Okay, and, uh, and also linear models are definitely not as rich as nonlinear models. So this are, there's a gap that we hope to bridge. And also it's not very surprising that when we do have good features, the problem becomes lower dimensional, right? This is like a basic, uh, uh, basic intuition from statistics. And what if we don't know good features? So there have been a lot of work in this domain called like state representation learning, mostly empirical, and also uh, I think Sam Du and uh, Nan, they have this nice work on how to do latent state encoding during online reinforcement learning in the tabular case. So I think this is an interesting problem, and uh, I hope to discuss with you what can be done in this domain. So what could be good state features? I already explained that our assumption was that the transition, uh, in this case I call it operator, but the transition matrix can be represented in using lower dimensional subspace. Right? Or this is just stationary Markov chain, no decision. So if we look at the value function of a stationary Markov process, and naturally this is one definition of value function. And now if we believe that the transition system that we are working with is actually not that complicated, we might be working with raw pixel images, but they correspond to lower dimensional hidden physical states. So in those cases, we are willing to assume that this transition matrix or transition kernel, which we don't know, has approximately lower rank structures. Maybe it has such a decomposition with P tilde here being something much smaller. So under this low rank assumption, then one can show that both the value function and also the invariant measure lie in low dimensional spaces. So if we want to find good features, I think the proposal is to directly look at principal components of the transition matrix. So uh, we try to do something in this domain, but without the control part. We just look at time series data, and we try to figure, we try to estimate the spectral decomposition, the left and the right principal components of the transition kernel. Uh, purely from data. And again, this can be formulated into an optimization problem. And our goal is to map a complicated state into a lower dimensional vector to preserve the transition dynamics. So I'm going to go over this quickly. So the basic idea is the following. So suppose that we are dealing with a higher dimensional time series, but we are given a kernel space tool, and we believe that the kernel space is relevant to the transition dynamics of the time series. And then we want to do some estimation. So what we do is we try to open up the kernel space by approximating it using random Gaussian features. So first we have something that can be computed in compact representations. And the key is we can estimate a projection of the transition kernel from data. And then the projection 
matrix can be again opened up using spectral decomposition to get a lower dimensional mapping. So we call this like a kernelized diffusion map estimator. So what can be done is we hope to uh, capture information in the conditional transition, in the conditional density for a particular state. And after this, we can map it into a lower dimensional map. Hopefully, the dimension is related to the approximate rank. OK. Uh, let me skip maybe this. OK. And uh, actually, so this approach I just described has a close connection to diffusion process and dimension reduction there. So for example, if, we, if our data is trajectories of a stochastic diffusion process, we can use the approach we described to generate embeddings of the state space. Oh, wait, let me skip. To generate embeddings of the state space and also to identify metastable clusters, which are notions from uh, against stochastic processes. Okay. Okay. Let me skip this probably. Okay. So uh, another thing we try to work on is again suppose that we're looking at trajectories generated by an unknown <coughs> random walk. Okay. And we try to use a convex hull to approximate the state space. And by convex hull, I mean that I want to find a representative state such that their convex combination can describe dynamics originated from other states. So this can be both down to estimation of a non-negative factorization problem. And this is an interesting experiment. So we can show that by analyzing traffic data from Manhattan and try to approximate locations in Manhattan City using a convex hull, then the vertices of the convex hull tend to be landmarks of the city. And uh, they actually carry integral meaning about what is the underlying dynamics. Okay. Yeah, so finally we had an experiment together with DQN to analyze trajectories of Atari game. And one can show that by reducing the dimensionality of game states using the embedding diffusion map idea, one can actually identify pair of game states that have larger, much larger distance in their original form but they are very close after embedding. And the approximating embedding, and if we, read, if we really look at the pair of game states, they actually have very interesting physical meanings about the current, I would say, like uh, strategical state of the game. OK, so I don't have time to talk about all this. And uh, so this is a list of collaborators and students. And uh, so there are a lot of open problems in reinforcement learning. Theoretically, how can we understand it from statistical and online learning perspectives? And also, how to do dimension reduction effectively while doing reinforcement learning? So hopefully, we can work together. And thank you very much. Any question? I have a question. So I think Peter asked this question, but I didn't hear. So you don't maintain uh, the M uh, matrix during your algorithm that the whole thing remains a transition probability. You don't care about it, or you do? Uh, you do the upper confidence of the M. In, in, the, in, the, in the algorithm with regret guarantee, one can, uh, okay, okay. So first, uh, one way to do that is to maintain that matrix. Another way to do that is suppose that we have kernel information. Or, or features. It's really about a particular way to do regression over the data points we have. Does it make sense? Yeah, but the intermediate uh, transition that you learn is not necessarily a transition probability. I mean the raw data. We don't have to carry the raw data. That makes sense? Because you build an upper bound, maybe I, I missed that you build an upper bound mm -hmm. around your uh, end. Mm -hmm. So right. this phi, is phi times m side remains in the transition matrix or not? Uh, OK, in this case, this MN is. No, I'm, I'm talking about the previous one that you get a linear in the. And they're uh, equivalent. OK. This one? Yes. Uh, this is an abstract way to write down the algorithm. But we don't have to, uh, so we don't really have to do optimization here. It has a closed form. Okay, maybe we'll take further questions offline in the interest of time and thank the speaker again.